All praise is due to Allah who has blessed us with Islam and blessed us with this life and this life is a blessing and one of the greatest proofs of the blessing of this life is how few people want to leave it there are very very few people who are suicidal who have become so despaired of this life so disgruntled with this life so dissatisfied with this life that they will take measures to leave it that's one of the proofs of the blessing of life itself alhamdulillah all praise is due to allah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens his scripture the quran with the surah the chapter referred to as al-fatiha the opening and this chapter opens up for us not only the rest of the Qur'an, but it opens up to us the pathway to a successful life. The first, the first thing we need to do or to know to lead a successful life is to know that we have a creator. And the first thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does in his book is he introduces himself to us Bismillah rahman rahim in the name of Allah in the name of Allah or with the name of Allah Ar-Rahman the one who is inherently merciful Ar-Rahim the one who extends that mercy to others so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduces us, himself to us by name. His name, the name of the creator of the heavens and the earth and all between is Allah. Bismillah, in the name of Allah. And then after introducing or informing us of his name, he informs us of his most preponderant attribution some people we meet and immediately we know their dominant characteristic you know this person is stingy this person is self-centered this person is egocentric this person is gentle this person person is harsh we know from the initial meeting Allah Ta'ala after informing us of his name Allah he informs us of his dominant, predominant, or preponderant attributes, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. The one who is inherently merciful and the one who extends that mercy to others. And the most significant of those others, Allah Ta'ala informs us in the Qur'an, وَكَانَ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَحِيمًا And he is merciful to the believers. He is merciful to everyone. But he is especially merciful to the believers. And the greatest mercy he's, in, he's bestowed upon the believer is faith itself. Is faith itself. Some people believe if I have material wealth, then God has been merciful to me. If I have uh, intellect, I've been shown mercy. If I have physical safety and security, mercy has been shown to me. But the greatest manifestation of Allah Ta'ala's mercy, mercy to a human being in this world is the blessing of faith. Because the blessing of faith makes the absent of everything else bearable. But if a person has no faith, then there's very little that that person can bear the absence of. With no faith, the lack of money becomes unbearable. With no faith, the lack of a spouse becomes unbearable. With no faith, the lack of various material things can 
in some instances become unbearable. But with faith, real faith and true faith, the lack of a car, a house, a spouse, a job, money, a bank account is all bearable. Because a person finds in his or her relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the sweetness of life that makes everything else in life bitter. And the loss or lack of anything that's bitter is bearable. La ilaha illallah. So he informs us of his mercy. And then he informs us of his might. Alhamdulillah, or before that, he gives us a reason to praise him. He's to be praised because of his mercy. Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. Bismillah Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Allah Ta'ala is praiseworthy because of his mercy. He's praiseworthy for many things, but in this context, because he has manifested his mercy to us, he has manifested his mercy to this creation in establishing balances in everything. He's manifested his mercy, and he's to be praised for that. When we understand the mercy in our lives, as it's been manifested to us in our lives, what is left for us except to say, Alhamdulillah. When we realize how merciful Allah has been to us, He's guided us to faith. He's guided us to a realization of who we are. He's placed no enmity in our hearts based on the teachings of this religion that will lead us to despise or hate another person because of their race or their color or their ethnicity or their origin or their socioeconomic status. The Qur'an doesn't encourage the poor people to envy and rebel against the rich. It encourages the rich people to be charitable to the poor so that the wealth circulates in society and everyone has a basic standard of living and a basic standard of well-being. But some people have more than others and we're encouraged to pray for them and to acknowledge Allah Ta'ala's bounty that He's extended to them. And He doesn't encourage the wealthy people to look down on and despise the poor people. He doesn't encourage them to think of ways they can keep them locked into poverty. But he encourages them to enrich them. Give them from the wealth of Allah he's given you. And zakat isn't what we think it is. Zakat, its origin, its asl, is to be given in gold if you have gold. Or silver if you have silver. Or grain if you have grain. And not a little bit of grain so you can have dinner tonight. That's zakat al-fitr. Zakat is to bring someone a ton of grain so that they can go to the marketplace, become self-sufficient, not only self-sufficient, can themselves engage in commerce, and then they have an excess that they can then extend to others. It's to enrich people and to make people self-sufficient. Not to just divvy up a little, little here, a little there, to give a lot here so that that person can become self-sufficient. And that person can then extend and be merciful to others as others have been merciful to him or her. So that the mercy is never lacking. And as we reflect on Allah Ta'ala's mercy, not only in the teachings that He extends to us in the Qur'an, but the mercy He's extended to us in our lives. A person might say, well, I, I haven't experienced much mercy in my life. Are you so upset that you're out trying to end someone else's life? Are you so upset that you're trying to end your own life? You're so wretched, you've been afflicted with these suicidal impulses. Are you so upset that you still can't smile in the face of your children or your neighbors or your relatives? Are you so upset you can't go outside on a day like today and find some beauty that warms your heart? 
And if you say no, 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 no to all of the above, then that's a manifestation of Allah's mercy in your life. And that's sufficient reason to say Alhamdulillah. So when you step out of these doors, look at the sky, look at the flowers in bloom, even in the heart of the city, and say Alhamdulillah, all praise is due to Allah. For His mercy, Ar Rahman Ar Rahim, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Then He mentions His power. He's mentioned His Jamal, His mercy. Bismillah Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. Then He, Alhamdulillah. Then He mentions His jal Jalal, His power, Rabbil Alameen. The Lord, the owner, the sovereign of all the worlds. So he mentions his majesty. Rabbil Alameen. How much power does it take to control the world? All of the worlds. To decree every process that unfolds in every corner of creation at every moment of creation. Infinite power. Infinite might. Unqualified strength. But even after mentioning that, he reminds us again, don't allow that to overwhelm you. Don't allow that to absorb you and to remove you away from the dominant reality. Yes, I'm the Lord of the worlds. But unless you, lest you forget, I'm inherently merciful and I extend my mercy to others. Ar-Rahman Rahim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim So he surrounds his majesty with his mercy Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim And then he reminds us Maliki Yawm Bid-Din He comes back to his might He comes back to his Jalal Maliki Yawmiddin, the owner, the master, the sovereign of the day of judgment. Maliki the owner, Maliki the sovereign. Hafs Warsh. وَمَنْ يُدْلِلْ فَلَا هَادِيَ لَهُ وَشَرُوا أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَحْدُهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ وَشَرُوا أَنَّ سَيِّدَنَا مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ الَّذِي تَسَاءَلُونَ بِهِ وَالْأَرْحَامِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ عَلَيْكُمْ رَقِيبًا يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَقُولُوا قَوْلًا سَدِيدًا يُصْلِحْ لَكُمْ عَمَالَكُمْ وَيُغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ وَمَنْ يُطْعِ إِلَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدْ فَازَ فَوْزًا عَظِيمًا أَمَّا بَعْدُ ف إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستغفره ونتوب إليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مدل له. Why this tartib, this arrangement? After his mercy, after he reminds us again, he mentions his majesty. But what context? Maliki Yomiddin, the owner or the sovereign of the day of judgment. What happens on the day of judgment as far as we're concerned? We're told by our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah Ta'ala has divided His mercy into 100 parts. One part He dispenses amongst the creation and all of the mercy that's manifested by every living thing from the beginning of creation until the end. The other 99 parts, he's held back to be dispensed amongst us when? Yawm al on the day of judgment. La ilaha illallah. 
So he reminds us, Maliki Yomidin, of the time and the place, the maqam, the station where his mercy will be more manifest than at any other time. Ar Rahman Ar Rahim Maliki Yomidin. And if we recognize that, if we know he is Allah, who Allah, that's his name, Allah. And if we know of his mercy, Alhamdulillah, Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim. And if we praise him as he should rightfully be praised, Alhamdulillah. And if we understand his power and his, ma his might, that he controls our life, that he gave us this life, that he sustains this life, that he controls this life, every breath that we're in existence, that he controls our fate. He will make the determination as to ultimately we are d disposed to hell or we're entered into paradise. If we know that, and then we understand that despite that awesome power that he has as the Lord, Rabbil Alameen, he is still the inherently merciful who extends his mercy to others. Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. And if we know that most of that mercy, 99 out of 100 parts, are held back to when we will be judged. Maliki Yomiddin. How can we do anything other than worship him? Iyaka na'abudu. Iyaka na'abudu. Who else would be deserving of, of, of worship? Who else would be fittingly worshipped? Who else can we fittingly bow down and humble ourselves to than the one whom possesses those descriptions? Iyaka na'abudu. Iyaka na'abudu. And this is the point we want to focus on. Iyaka na'abudu. Many who are engaged or have been engaged throughout human history in the philosophical quest, one of the greatest questions that has occupied their minds is what is the purpose of this life? What is the purpose of life? This question has vexed philosophers it has challenged theologians, but we have a clear, simple, unequivocal answer. Unequivocal answer. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Allah Ta'ala says, I have only created the jinn and the humans that they worship me. The purpose of this life is to worship our Lord. The purpose of this life is to worship our Lord. That's why we're here. And worship is wide, it can be vast. One of our scholars dis uh, defines mercy. كُلُّ مَا يُحِبُّهُ اللَّهُ يَرْضَاهُ مِنَ الْعَمَالِ الظَّاهِرَةِ وَالْبَاطِنَةِ كُلُّ مَا يُحِبُّهُ اللَّهُ يَرْضَاهُ Allahumma sallu rasulillah من 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 أقوال وعمال الظاهرة والباطنة. Everything that Allah loves and is pleased with, from our speech and our internal and external actions, that's worship. So worship isn't just praying. Worship isn't just fasting. Worship isn't just zakah or charity. Worship isn't just going to Hajj. Worship is everything. That Allah Ta'ala, that Almighty God loves and is pleased with from our speech, our internal and external actions. And our actions are the greatest witness to our speech. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu lima taquluna ma la taf'aloon kabura maqtan inda Allahi an taqulu ma la taf'aloon Oh, you believers, why do you say that which you don't do? Hate is, hated is it with Allah that you say that which you don't do. Islam is not empty talk. So the, the actions are a testimony to the speech. And the speech is a testimony to what's in the heart. One of our poets mentioned, لا يعجبنك من خطيب قطبة حتى يكون مع الكلام أصيلا إنما الكلام لا في الفؤاد وإنما جعل 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 لسان على ما في الفؤاد دليلا. Don't be amazed 
by the speech of a speaker. Lajur yurji bennaka min khatibin qutbatun. Don't be amazed and impressed by the qutbah that the khatib gives, or more generally by the speech of a speaker of a speaker. Hatta yakuna ma'al kalami asila until there's something to authenticate that speech. Rather, speech resides in the heart, and rather, the tongue has only been made as an indicator for what's in the heart. The tongue has been made as an indicator of what's in the heart, and the limbs have been made as an indicator of what's on the tongue. And this is why we strive for the total rectification of the human being. We don't want to rectify people's tongues. If that were the case, instead of the Qur'an, we give them Shakespeare. If they could read Arabic, the Qur'an is the Shakespeare of the Arabic language, to use that parable. But in English, we give them Shakespeare maybe. Carlyle, Canterbury Tales or something. But we don't just strive for the rectification of the tongue. We strive for the rectification of the heart and the rectification of the tongue and the rectification of the limbs. Total rectification of the human being. That's our goal. And this is what we have to bring into the world, brothers and sisters. And we'll come back to this. So, I've only created the jinn and the humans that they worship me. <coughs> that they worship me. That's our purpose. And as we said, worship is, va is vast. At the essence of worship, al-ibadah, there are two things. a ta obedience, wa tadallul, or wa tawada, and humility. Obedience and humility. That's at the foundation of worship and that's one of the reasons so much of the Islamic moral system strives to inculcate in the believer obedience of our Lord and humility in our actions our state and our hearts humility because humility is one of the great keys to obedience you can't obey someone you don't humble themselves to can you go in and get my uh, phone? I left it in the car and I didn't lock my car. It's right on the seat. Someone could take it. I go get your own phone. Why should I get your phone? You should be going to get my phone. You won't obey someone you don't humble yourself to. Now, who are you to tell me to do anything? No, I don't care. Someone steal your phone. Who are you asking me? to go do something for you. Oh, humility allows us, the Prophet وسلم, he's our exemplar. If children asked him to do something, he would go do it. Imam Malik is related that he was in the masjid, he came into the masjid after the congregation had pre performed asr. In his school, there's no prayer after the congregational prayer until the sun sets. And these students who were waiting for him saw him pray two rakats. And they said, Imam Malik, what's this? You told us there's no prayer after the congregation. The congregation passed, and now we see you praying. He said, that little boy passed. When I passed by, he said, Malik, prostrate yourself. And I reflected on the Qur'an, the verse that says, and when they're told to prostrate, they prostrate themselves, or they refuse to prostrate. And when it's said to them, prostrate yourself, they refuse to do so, hell is for those who belie the truth. So he said, I didn't want to come over the hukka under the ruling of the verse. And where did it come from? A little boy. From a boy. A person who understands the nature of reality 
doesn't fear humbling himself or herself. Because number one, they understand that's an integral part of me worshiping my Lord. Why are so many people turning away from the worship of God? Because they've arrogated themselves. I don't need religion. That's just old-fashioned old superstition. I don't need that. We're human. I, I have this great mind. Where'd you get it? <laughs> Why aren't you like a chimpanzee? Or an orangutan? Especially in the case that you say you evolved from the apes. You say, I'm not saying it. That's what Mr. Intellect says, we evolved from the apes. Why is there such a huge gap between you and the closest ape then? Evolution implies slow change over a long period of time, does it not? We say he, he evolved into an entirely different person. So he didn't wake up one day and bam, he's different. Just slowly went to school, got a job, became more responsible, got married, assumed the responsibilities of marriage, and over time became a whole different person. But it is, it, he, man, he went to, a, to that boot camp program for one month and it revolutionized him. He, boom, almost overnight, new person, but evolve is slow. So if we slowly evolve from the apes, why is there such a huge gap between us and the apes? How come the best an ape can do is use a stick, all of them, to get some meat out of the nut? And they've been doing that for generation after generation after generation, which is another blessing on humans. Allah Ta'ala has not, not only blessed us with this intellect that nothing else in this creation shares, <coughs> He's blessed us with the ability to accumulate knowledge. So when we see a cell phone, that's not uh, something that people working for Bill Gates or Steve Jobs came up with. That's, in a, that's a result of the accumulation of human knowledge from the beginning of time, which allows us to do what? Not to have to reinvent the wheel. What does someone say? They see you doing something that's already been worked out. Don't reinvent the wheel. That's already been figured out. Let me explain it to you. But every generation of monkeys has to do what? They, you can't say reinvent the wheel. Monkeys haven't gotten to the wheel yet. But they have to use primitive tools, a stick or a stone to break, like their monkey ancestors. Whereas human beings started with the stone and the stick, and now human beings are using invisible digital signals bounced off of satellites hundreds of miles in, in the sky in syn uh, synchronized Earth orbit. They figured out how to do that, make the satellite stay in the same place over the Earth for years without falling. Based on its own momentum, the satellite doesn't have a rocket that's keeping it moving with the Earth. It's, it's based on the gravitational pull of the Earth bouncing a signal off that satellite so that we can talk right now if you have the necessary iPhone 4 to someone halfway around the world and you evolve from an ape. Evolved from an ape. And, beca and because you evolved from an ape, you become too arrogant to prostrate yourself to your Lord. Alayhi wa sallam, Allah Ta'ala has divided His mercy into 100 parts. One part, he dispenses amongst the creation and all of the mercy that's manifested by every living thing from the beginning of creation until the end. The other 99 parts, he's held back to be dispensed amongst us when? Yawm al on the Day of Judgment. La ilaha illallah. So, why this tartib, this arrangement? After his mercy, after he reminds us again, he mentions his majesty. But what context? Maliki Yomiddin, the owner or the sovereign of the day of judgment. What happens on the day of judgment as far as we're concerned? We're told by our Prophet, we're entered into paradise. 
If we know that, and then we understand that despite that awesome power that he has as the Lord, Rabbil Alameen, he is still the inherently merciful who extends his mercy to others, Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. And if we know that most of that mercy, 99 out of 100 parts, are held back to when we will be judged. Maliki Yawmi Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. And if we praise him as he should rightfully be praised, Alhamdulillah. And if we understand his power and his, ma his might, that he controls our life, that he gave us this life, that he sustains this life, that he controls this life every breath that we're in existence, that he controls our fate. He will make the determination as to ultimately we are d disposed to hell. So he reminds us, Maliki Yawmiddin, of the time and the place, the maqam, the station where his mercy will be more manifest than at any other time. Ar Rahman Ar Rahim Maliki Yawmiddin. And if we recognize that, if we know he is Allah, who Allah, that's his name, Allah. And if we know of his mercy, Alhamdulillah, Bismillah. Humility allows us to prostrate ourselves to our Lord. And a believer doesn't fear humbling himself for the sake of God. Where if you're humble, people push over you. They think you're a chump, you're a punk. They're just gonna trample on you. The next time I see you, you're gonna have footprints on your chest. A believer doesn't fear that because a believer believes not only in the promise of Allah, but in the promise of the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who said no one humbles themselves for the sake of Allah except that Allah elevates them. And Allah Ta'ala when believers believed that, He gave them control of the world. And when believers got away from that and started relying on their own power and became too humble to humble themselves before Allah and to humble themselves before their fellow human beings, Allah took power away from them. There are forces at work that defy our physical calculations. That defy our reasoned arguments. And those are the forces we need to tap into. Because those are the real keys to power and strength, authority and dignity in the world. So, humility, at tadhallul or we could say tawada and love, mahabba. Those are the foundations of worship. Those are the qualities that make iyak and abudu a living reality in the heart of the believer. In the interest of time, there was more we want to say. We want to remind myself and you of a few verses that convey to us what Allah loves. Allah Ta'ala says, in Allah yuhibbul muhsineen. Allah loves the people who exemplify excellence in all that they do. In Allah yuhibbul muhsineen. Allah loves the people of excellence. Excellence in their worship, excellence in their relationship with their fellow human beings, excellence in their relationship in, in the work that they do, excellence in every realm. We're encouraged to be people of excellence. In Allah katab al ihsan ala kulli shay. Allah has ordained excellence in everything, as our Prophet informs us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then he goes on to say, if you slaughter, do it in a most excellent fashion. Sharpen your knife and give rest to the animal. Because that animal is going to become part of you. You are what you eat. You are what you eat. And so that animal, and people might say, you know, slaughter, sacrifice, they're filming this, they'll think. This is a, a, a concept that's not some crude, uh, barbaric process. This is, again, there are forces at work. An animal wants to be slaughtered when he or she knows they're going to be part of your righteous deeds. They're going to give you fuel to do righteous deeds, pleasing to your Lord. This is a reality. And the opposite is also true. So it behooves us to be excellent in everything. From the mundane to the most 
refined articulation of our religious and ethical principles to have excellence. Allah Ta'ala mentioned, Allah yuhibbu tawabina wa yuhibbu mutatahirin. Allah loves those who turn to Him in repentance. Allah Ta'ala loves to accept repentance, which means what? Allah Ta'ala isn't concerned with us messing up. Some of us, we mess up, so to speak. Then we're down in the dumps, we get so far down in the dumps, we forget to repent. That's the problem. The problem is not the sin. The problem is the refusal to repent for the sin. Sinning is not good. I'm not saying it's, but it's not an inherent problem. Sinning will not put you in hell unless you fail to repent from the sin. And sincere repentance vows to never return. So perhaps if you keep falling and falling and falling into the sin, maybe you're not sincere in the conditions of repentance. But the sin will not ruin you. The failure to repent will ruin you. For that reason, Allah loves those who repent. So then say, إِنَّ اللَّهِ يُحِبُّ مَنْ تَخَلَّصَ مِنَ الذُّنُوبِ Allah loves those who are free from sin. No, Allah loves those who turn to Him in repentance. وَيُحِبُّ الْمُتَطَاهِرِينَ And He loves those who keep themselves pure. Pure in their dress, pure in their thoughts, pure in their actions, pure in their speech. And we've said many times, that's why we don't imitate the speech of vile, profane people. It's not fitting a Muslim to walk around with profanity coming out of his or her mouth. Because why? These are not pure. Even if you say, well, the meanings change. It's not pure in its origin. And we always look at the origin of, fear, of, of things. And what were they intended for? Its, a, its original intent was vulgar. And that vulgarity affects people. There was a young lady, some of you might have heard her, uh, a spoken word artist who does poetry. And she says to she said, but in poetic form, I'm summarizing what she said. She says, funny how the young men in our community acted with a, a lot more maturity and self-respect and respect for others when they called each other my man, as opposed to calling each other my boy and my dog. Think about it. You are what you eat. We don't eat just eat physical food, we eat messages. When I was growing up, you say, yo, what's up, my man? My man, my man, my man, my man. Now I hear the young folks, my boy, what's up my boy? What's up my dog? What's up my nigga? And we wonder why we got problems. You are what you eat. And the food is not just physical food. Purity of speech. Purity of thought. We're not just purity of clothing. Not extravagant clothing. What we have should be pure. We don't want pig in it. We don't want something that's stolen. I'm looking good in my stolen goods. No, you're not. You're looking wretched. Because your good-looking stolen goods testify to the wretchedness of your character. And if you were internally sound, you look good in whatever you wore. It might have holes and patches on it. Your internal beauty will beautify it. Man, you look good. So you inherit them clothes from your grandparents? They sure look good on you. La ilaha illallah. In Allah yuhibbu al-muhsineen. In Allah yuhibbu al-tawabeen wa yuhibbu al-mutatahireen. He loves those who are pure. In Allah yuhibbu al-muttaqeen. He loves those who are mindful of his commandments and prohibitions. We should be mindful. And that should weigh on us. It should impact our character. Am I keeping myself within the parameters of Allah Ta'ala's 
established. Almighty God's established for my actions. That's the challenge for a human being. That's what dignifies a human being. That's what humanizes a human being. It's not just let it all hang out that humanizes us. You don't even find animals that just let it all hang out unless they're rabid or something. They have rabies and have lost their faculties. Animals have restraint. They won't even fight each other to the death. So one animal gets the other one down, the other one gets up and goes off, says, well, I'm not encroaching on this territory. But the animal doesn't come kick him and gore him until he's dead. You don't find that in the animal kingdom. You find it in the zoo. You find it in an artificial environment. And to a certain extent, we all live in a human zoo, which makes it especially critical for us to consciously rise above our circumstances by holding on to what our Lord has given us to hold on to. Hold fast to the rope of Allah, which is the Quran, and don't be divided amongst yourselves. These are, these are the people Allah loves. Wallahu yuhibbu sabirin. Allah loves those who are patient. Patience is a virtue. That's what all of us heard that. Even those of us who didn't grow up Muslim. Patience is a virtue, our parents would tell us. We read in the books, patience is a virtue. It's a virtue because patience, again, is one of those found foundational traits that is a key to a successful life. You might not get it today, you might not get it tomorrow. But if you live right and you do right, sooner or later you're going to get it if it's good. If it's good and worth having, you're going to get it. But sometimes it takes patience. Because Allah Ta'ala, in many instances, He doesn't give it to us right away because He sees, do we really want it? Do we really value it? Do we really cherish it? Do we have a real desire for it? Allah Ta'ala will test us. As we said, words are empty. I really want this. Okay, how long are you willing to wait for it? Uh, two weeks? You don't want it too bad. Your words are false. If you really wanted it, you'd be willing to wait for it. You'd be willing to wait a lifetime for it. How long did Nuh السلام, wait for the rectification of his people? He didn't write them off in two weeks. I made dawah, they didn't respond, forget them, Allah destroyed them. 900 years. He waited 900 years for the rectification of his people. That's patience. How long did Ibrahim السلام, wait for a child? He waited 80 years. No, I married the sister and we've been married six months. She's not pregnant yet. Man, I gotta, you know, I, I gotta get a mother, you know. She, six months. How long did Ibrahim السلام, wait? 80 years. 80 years. That's patience. We have to really look at the standards that Allah Ta'ala has given us to measure ourselves by. That's what they're there for. Inna Ibrahim kana ummatan qanita lillah. Ibrahim was an ummah. One me meaning of an ummah, an example. The prophets السلام, are examples. That's why they're human beings. We can't say they're angels, so we human, they're angels, how could we be like that? No, we're human, they're human. And we can't be exactly like them, but we can begin to strive to attain what they attain to. And finally, well there's more. Inna Allah yuhibbul mutawakkileen. Allah loves those who trust in Him. Allah loves those who trust in Him. Brothers and sisters, everything's going to be all right. Don't panic. Say it's bad for Muslims right now. It depends on how you look at things. It depends on how you look at things. If you look at my good, good or bad with me is based on my relationship with Allah, then it's as good or as bad as you make it. 
was a powerful hadith Qudsi. The beginning of it, uh, Allahumma sallu rasulillah, ana inda dhanni abdi bi. I am as my servant thinks I am. That's the basis for good or bad. If my servant, the human being, thinks I don't exist, I won't exist. I am as my servant thinks I am. Atheism isn't a proof for the non-existence of Allah. Atheism is a proof for the existence of Allah because Allah Ta'ala's existence is so manifest only He could veil Himself from someone. Only He has the power to veil Himself from someone. If a person thinks Allah is merciful, they'll find mercy. If a th person thinks Allah is, is, is stern, they'll find sternness. But the sternness won't, because, won't, because, won't be because Allah Ta'ala is not merciful. It will because, be because of the circumstances and situations that person imposes on himself or herself because they've shielded themselves from Allah Ta'ala's mercy. Those are the foundations of worship. Those are the qualities that make iyyak and abudu a living reality in the heart of the believer. In the interest of time, there was more we want to say. We want to remind myself and you of a few verses that convey to us what Allah loves. Allah Ta'ala says, In Allah yuhibbul muhsineen. Allah loves, the, believes not only in the promise of Allah, but in the promise of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who said, no one humbles themselves for the sake of Allah except that Allah elevates them. And Allah Ta'ala, when believers believed that, He gave them control of the world. And when believers got a reasoned arguments. And those are the forces we need to tap into. Because those are the real keys to power and strength, authority and dignity in the world. So, humility, at tadallul or we could say tawada, and love, mahabba. Those away from that and started relying on their own power and became too humble to humble themselves before Allah and to humble themselves before their fellow human beings. Allah took power away from them. There are forces at work that defy our physical calculations that defy our humility allows us to prostrate ourselves to our Lord. And a believer doesn't fear humbling himself for the sake of God. Where if you're humble, people push over you. They think you're a chump, you're a punk. They're just gonna trample on you. The next time I see you, you're gonna have footprints on your chest. A believer doesn't fear that because a believer